Canadian Baptists have long been involved in responding to situations of humanitarian crises around the world. Uh, we've been on the ground in some of the most difficult and challenging, most devastating situations, uh, tsunamis in Indonesia, uh, typhoons in the Philippines, earthquakes in Haiti. Um, we've worked with our partners in Nepal recently uh, as they've helped to rebuild uh, their communities after devastating earthquakes. Um, back in 1984, when Ethiopia was in the grips of uh, a horrible famine and war, uh, Canadian Baptists worked with our partners across Canada to help bring food relief. Um, crises are difficult opportunities for the church. They're difficult times for us to know how to respond. My name is Terry Smith, and I'm the executive director of Canadian Baptist Ministries, and it is my great honor to introduce um, two remarkable women who uh, have been able to work with church groups around the world at times of crises. Um, our first guest is uh, a friend that I've worked with closely for many years now, Rachel Conway Dole. Rachel is the facilitator of the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development and is also the coordinator for relief work for BMS uh, World Mission. Uh, Rachel is based in Didcot in the United Kingdom. I'm also really happy to introduce to our followers on CBM Calling, Musu Taylor Lewis. Musu is the Director of Resources and Church Engagement for uh, the Food Grains Bank. Um, uh, Musu is originally from Vancouver, but I believe Musu, you're on this call from just north of Toronto. As I lead this organization, uh, as we seek to bring uh, help and relief in times of crises, I get to interact with uh, very gifted people like the two of you. Um, so Rachel, you're in England and uh, I know you well enough to be able to ask this question. You live on a narrow boat, what we would call a barge or a canal boat here in Canada. And I had to look this up today and your house is six feet, 10 inches wide. Um, you live on a narrow boat on a canal. How in the world are you coping during a pandemic stuck on a narrow boat? Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's great to be uh, with you this evening and uh, well, evening for me, uh, middle of the day for you guys. And um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm actually very fortunate. Uh, it's been good weather recently. I'm living with someone I've chosen to live with, my husband. Um, we get on well and uh, you know, we have enough food and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so actually it's been, uh, it's not been a bad experience for us. Uh, it's been a little cramped at times, but we're, we're working with it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And Musa, tell us uh, where you are. I know you're not too far from the Toronto area. Where are you? Well, I'm in a, a community called Aurora, just north of Toronto. And um, things are quieter than usual, as it is in many parts of the world right now. Not a lot of activity and uh, feeling like the weather is feeling the confusion. Uh, in the last two days, we had snow flurries when we're just a week away from the unofficial start of summer even to this morning. Oh, my gosh. Well, I trust you're, you're both uh, fending well with, with your families. So here we are in the midst of the gravest of health crises uh, in recent history. Um, but health isn't the only concern that many people in the world are facing today. The World Food Program uh, had projected that in the year 2020, over 135 million people around the world would experience um, uh, severe hunger and perhaps even starvation. And since the COVID-19 crisis has uh, uh, begun, they have had to double that number. So now they are expecting that at the kind of sharp end of the point of this um, food crisis worldwide, it's 260 million people that are, uh, I think the term is racing towards starvation. Um, the crisis points of such a food uh, shortage in the world are affecting some countries far more gravely than others. Uh, I think of the situation in South Sudan or in Yemen. Um, Rachel, you and I have talked about the crisis in Venezuela. Um, we're particularly concerned by the situation in the DR Congo, uh, the situation in refugee camps around the world. 
Um, CBM works with two vital partners uh, in bringing hope and healing in a broken world. Um, one is uh, our partnership here in Canada with 14 other church houses, uh, and it's crystallized through uh, the Food Grains Bank. Musa, and you're a director there. Uh, the other partner that we work with closely is the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development, which is um, a network within the Baptist World Alliance. So let me begin by asking you this first question, if I can, Musu. Can you give us an understanding of some of the terms that we hear when we talk about food security versus food aid, and how does that affect the type of responses that we have? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to give you a formal de definition of food security that we use is that when everybody has access to enough uh, um, nutritious food to live healthy and active lives, then we have achieved food security in the world and our vision of a world without hunger. Um, however, if you want to put that in, in terms that we can see and, and, and think about, uh, food security simply means uh, if somebody is experiencing food insecurity, it means that they don't know if they'll have a meal tomorrow. They may not be sure if they're going to have a meal next week, and maybe not next month. They might have enough days, but they're very uncertain about what the um, food situation will be in a month from now. And they're experiencing uh, food insecurity in that situation. Um, when you talk about those 100 and 260 million uh, people who possibly were facing the highest crisis levels of food insecurity, we're talking about people who are now definitely missing meals. They might be going without food for a number of days, and they're at the point where they're beginning to sell assets in order to buy food. In a Western context, we'd be thinking about people who might be thinking about uh, selling a car. Um, but in a developing world, it might be somebody who's thinking of selling their, their goat or um, other kinds of assets like that that keep them food secure. But in this moment, they need to sell that in order to, to buy food for their family. And so when talking about those highest levels of food insecurity, those crisis levels. We're talking about people who are skipping meals, who are going with food for days, and who are beginning to sell off the things that will keep them secure for years to come in order to do food today. Yeah. Thanks. And, okay. and the food aid responses um, are just the emergency food distribution that takes place in order to um, give them, um, you know, access to food today in order to begin to think about how they they work through and get through the crisis and into a more secure, a food secure situation. Hmm. One of the things I love about working with the Food Grains Bank, Musu, is the fact that we um, interact and collaborate uh, yes. through the Food Grains Bank with 14 other uh, denominational partners across yes. Canada. And it's an extremely broad uh, and ecumenical family that, um, in, includes the Adventists and the Pentecostals and the Presbyterians and the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics and Baptists and Salvation Army and the Alliance. And um, I know that a big part of your work consists of helping uh, all of our churches advocate on behalf of a greater engagement here in Canada among our member bodies and constituency, but also within the Canadian um, government. Uh, to fight for a world uh, without hunger. So how exactly does that happen? Well, it is a remarkable thing to have all of these church traditions working together for such a singular cause for a world without hunger. And uh, we operate as a partnership and in humility, recognizing that no one body can um, get us to a world without hunger. But part of that humility is also recognizing that even as the Food Grains Bank, this vast network of churches and congregations, that we still don't have everything it takes to achieve that vision. And that we, we need governments to come alongside in order to be part and parcel of the solution to hunger. Uh, that includes uh, government um, uh, development assistance that goes uh, towards food aid and towards food security projects. And so we encourage uh, Canadians uh, through the Food Grains Bank and our individual members uh, to talk to their members of parliament, to talk to government organizations, to advocate for a compassionate and generous Canada. And the mm -hmm. thing is that I am convinced that Canadians are already compassionate and generous. Unfortunately, it's often the contrary voices that are loudest. And so we want to make sure that we are adding to the, to the conversation, the ask to a government uh, that can, Canada continues to play its part um, 
uh, provide um, its fair share of um, aid to the world um, as a wealthy country and a compassionate and generous country. So that's really, we provide tools to do so. And um, some of those tools are available at our website, and, but they're also available through CBM and all of our other member agencies uh, for Canadians to take uh, various actions. Hmm. Thanks, Musu. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for all of the uh, good resources uh, that you make available to CBM and to our Canadian Baptist family. So Rachel, you and I have worked together in the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development for, oh my gosh, I think it's been over five years. And I know that one of the things that you're not really passionate about is how to, is engaging our global Baptist family to be more, um, uh, more involved and more engaged and more professional in the way that we seek to bring relief uh, in times of crisis. So could you just explain for um, our listeners how um, the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development works? How are we connecting with the Global Baptist family? Yeah, and it's, uh, I think it's a uh, networks like uh, the Food Grains Bank and the Forum for Aid and Development are really exciting opportunities, to be honest, to uh, draw together uh, the wealth of resources we have around the world and within our churches uh, to create such an impact to show God's love on a really tangible level. And so for uh, the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development, what we do is we say, actually, uh, as Baptists, generally, we're quite autonomous. Uh, it's in our DNA to kind of be independent, um, but saying, actually, let's provide an opportunity for us all to opt in with what we can at that time, what we have available at that time, be that from something just from simply prayers to people to communication resources to ideas to funding and how do we put all of that together into a big uh, kind of pot uh, to work really for as you say really professional and effective responses that have uh, those that are in need and in support right at the heart of them um, remembering that they're they're people and not projects um, that those are the people that actually um, you know we're we're saying we can help you, but actually they need to invite us, uh, invite us on the ground to do that. And as Baptist churches, we're really well placed uh, to do that with relationships around the world and in, in our local communities. Um, and I'm sure many of people that are listening in will kind of recognize that for that from their own contexts as well. Where would be some examples of places where our global Baptist family have worked well together? Yeah, so I think uh, you mentioned a couple at the beginning uh, of the uh, of, of this, and I think uh, often it is the places where there has been crisis where actually you see people really draw together. Uh, and so the Nepal earthquakes is a really good example. So although the massive devastation there with over 8,000 people sadly losing their lives, it was an opportunity for Baptists around the world to say, um, actually, how can we support the local Baptists uh, that are responding there how can we support local christian organizations uh, to respond and and the canadians um you were also generous uh really really generous and compassionate at that time as well and we're a really strong part of that uh, so nepal's been a really good example where we've continued to learn from that um and there are a num number of other responses as well um mm -hmm. around the world really where we've been working together mm -hmm. excellent yeah I've really appreciated it, Rachel how I think you had actually done your studies on collaboration and part and partnership in Haiti after the earthquake and then how that that, um, that has uh, helped shape the way that we work within the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development and that brings together um, kind of more professional agencies that that have years of experience in delivering relief and development work with some of the most needy partners that we have around the world, such as in South Sudan. Um, back to you, if I can, uh, Musu. Um, you get to speak truth to power. And I love that about, about uh, the Food Grains Bank. You, you help advocate on behalf of hungry people around the world to the Canadian government. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas of things that we could um, be telling our Canadian Baptist family in terms of advocating for uh, food aid and food assistance uh, currently. What, what could we be saying to our government officials? 
Well, uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, reminding uh, many of our um, our uh, elected officials, particularly, are not necessarily experts in uh, the area of food aid or, or um, uh, the global economic situation. So just reminding them of the basic information that we've heard today, for example, about the number of hungry, the number of people uh, um, going hungry who are going to double in this year, and also asking Canada to, to do its fair share to, to um, contribute to global efforts to um, stem the tide of people who will be in crisis levels, um, and to ask them to do so um, without taking away from the commitments that have already made, have been made to um, combat existing crises. People who have been running away from their homes, who have been forced to flee their homes due to conflict, people who are already dealing with the effects of climate change in say, Western Africa and the Sahel and dealing with drought already, those crises have not gone away. And so the um, requirements for dealing with um, COVID-19 and the effects of hunger that are coming out of that do not come, shouldn't come at the expense of um, also continuing to contribute to those efforts. And I think that is uh, particularly important. And sort of in Canada, we've really um, gone to bat beautifully for our, our domestic needs and made huge packages available to deal with the effects of COVID-19, but we're not doing that at the expense of ongoing um, protection programs that we have in place. And so we're asking the Canada think about the global efforts in the same way. Um, we, we always have sort of four asks that we make of Canadians. And the first one, of course, is to give. Um, the Canadians are being generous locally, and we ask them to remember also organizations like CBM, like Food Grains Bank, and whatever agency they're associated with that is helping overseas to demonstrate to the government. Um, as you know, uh, Terry, one of the things that we are a partner with the government of Canada and, and Canada um, with our food aid programs provides a four to one match. And that is a, a very powerful way to say to Canada, um, to, to say to the government, we support your ongoing um, aid overseas by making that $1 um, contribution that the government will match with four. Um, it's, a, it's a way of saying, yes, we want you to continue doing that. Of course, as Christians, we call the um, people to pray as well. This is an important part of our contribution. And learn, make sure you go to reliable mm -hmm. sources of information so that you're well informed and that you're able to um, send that, those uh, strong messages to the government. So those mm -hmm. are the four things we say, give, pray, learn, or advocate, but you can do some. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. Um, another question back to you, Rachel. Um, one of our core values at CBM is to work in partnership and to work by invitation. Uh, and those are two things that you described as part of, as intrinsic to the Baptist Forum for Aid and Development. Um, can you describe just real quickly how the network itself actually operates? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, um, it's really down again, as you say, that the invitation to participate is really key. And so um, there may be situations, so with like COVID, uh, it's going on around the world uh, it's not our um you know kind of prerogative or, or privilege to just kind of go and say hey we have this money we can spend it here to solve this problem uh, it's it's really not that actually it's our it's our um duty i guess and our uh, the requirement for good stewardship to go and talk to those people on the ground that are living in that place that's their home their community to say hey what's happening how are you doing can we pray with you um what's happening in your life and then let's look at how we can walk through this situation together um and so that's really what it's based on it's based on saying actually how can we join in with what you're already doing and what god is already doing in this place to enhance it to support it and to um, really shine a light on it um so that that church uh, and that community uh, can really kind of glorify God in their response and um, yeah, be a blessing to the people around them. And so I think that's really exciting, actually. Uh, and that's why it's great to have um, the Canadians on board with those with those values of partnership and invitation there. As you say, they're just so core to the response uh, of BFAD. So there's lots of lots of lots of calls to do, lots of conversations to have and lots of listening, really. Um, those are those are core to the responses happening. That's amazing. This is our 39th uh, CBM calling today. 
And I love asking this question to the participants when I have a chance of hosting this. Um, and this will be my last question to the two of you. In the midst of COVID-19 and everything we are living during this time of global crisis, where are you seeing signs of hope? You want to go first, Musu? Sure. Um, I mean, I take I see signs of hope in in the action being taken by people around the world. Mm. It's so encouraging um, to see grassroots organizations uh, just. Uh, leaping into action on behalf of their neighbors. As you know, our model is always working through local organizations. When we work with CBM, we're working with local organizations in those countries. And um, just as in Canada, we are watching neighbors helping neighbors. We also are in a privileged position to see that happening around the world. And that is profoundly encouraging to me. I'm also really, really encouraged right now on a, on a uh, you know, big picture level is to see the global community recognizing the need that is emerging um, around hunger and updating the global humanitarian uh, res um, res response plan. Um, and they've actually tripled the requirements uh, and asking the global community to contribute three times as much in order to stem this tide. And that gives me a lot of hope um, because uh, what they're saying is we need to rally as a global community all the resources we can to address all the effects of COVID-19, the health, the economic, the food crisis. Um, and uh, that gives me a lot of hope. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's a great answer, Muth. <laughs> so it's a really good summary, I think. Um, and I think I've, I'd say something very similar, actually, that actually, you know, it, although there is so much sadness and crisis going on around the world, there is such a phenomenal opportunity for us to take this moment and really transform our societies and our communities uh, um, with the local action that's happening uh, around the world everywhere. You'll be seeing it in your own communities as well. Um, it's a real opportunity to kind of grasp hold of uh, what it means to be family, what it means to be community, what it means to really be people and humans interacting with humans. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, um, out, of, out of crisis, there can become some really, really good opportunities um, for transformation and transformation of people's lives in lots of different ways. Yeah. Mm. I think I shared humanity is shining right now. It is. I, 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 I see it every day, Musu and Rachel, when I go for walks and I see how children have just written words in chalk on their driveways. Rachel doesn't have a driveway, she has a canal. But <laughs> children writing words of thanks to frontline workers. Uh, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and we are seeing something about human nature right now. And I think that we as um, Christians, as followers of Christ, need to find the way to, to leverage whatever goodwill is being mustered during this time to make sure that we are caring for the most vulnerable, uh, those people who are risking, um, risk, who are at, at incredible risk of, uh, of starvation during this, this crisis. Um, Musa, I, I'm going to uh, entrust a word of thanks to you and I'm gonna ask you to share it with um, your boss and my dear friend, Jim Cornelius and all of the staff at um, the Food Grains Bank, you, for over 35 years, um, your organization has helped champion the cause of the hungry around the world. And you continue to engage Canadians um, and you engage the Canadian government in making sure that we do something and we do more than we have done previously. So please pass along my gratitude and, and our, the assurance of our prayers. And Rachel, to you and your team at BMS, we're such dear friends and partners and all of, the, um, all of our partners in the Baptist Forum for Aid Development. I'm so grateful that we as Canadian Baptists can, can rally around this cause uh, with you. Um, there's people who have joined in our call today uh, to uh, following us who have asked to, to be mentioned to you and I'm so grateful for their, uh, for their greetings. Uh, they know who, who they are. Uh, um, Heather and uh, Estella, uh, Michael and John and others who, who have sent along a word of greeting and we uh, send greetings back to them. 
Um, I'm sitting here in my church, as you can tell, this is not the decoration of my house. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in my church and, you know, Sunday after Sunday over the last two and a half months, we've had to meet virtually um, uh, online in service. And, and yet being here and talking about how we as Canadian Baptists can do more for a hungry world, I'm, it challenges me to think of what we need to be doing as churches, uh, even during this time. So um, my gratitude to both of you for your leadership and your service. And uh, if you're following us on uh, CBM Calling today, I invite you to join our conversation tomorrow uh, when Jennifer Lau will be in conversation with Cheryl Bear talking about the impact of COVID-19 on Indigenous communities and what we can be doing to help address um, the needs in those communities as well. So thank you both. Have a good evening, Rachel. Have a good afternoon, uh, Musu, and I've appreciated our conversation. God bless you. Thanks, Bye-bye.